Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, my name is Adeze, and I'm the Communications Lead for Accelerate 2030. I'm really excited to have everyone here today for this special International Women's Day event. Um, and I promise it's going to be really good. And please get your questions ready. We have two amazing speakers, Bara, who is here right now, and um, Emily, who will be joining us soon. So, um, We're going to kick things off right away with this really amazing video from Impact Hub. In the fight for equality, women's voices rise with clarity. Their passion and strength are first to see. Today, we celebrate their legacy. Together, we are paving the way. Breaking barriers day by day. A resilience and courage inspire. A world, world where every woman can soar higher. Honoring those who came before and those who are still determined to do more. This is a pledge from all of us to fight for a world that's truly equal and right. Amazing. Um, I'm really proud to be part of the Impact Hope Network and the work that we do to support women across the globe. Um, like I said, my name is Adeze, um, and I work with Accelerate 2030. Accelerate 2030 is now the world's largest program for entrepreneurial solutions towards the SDGs. Our aim is to be a bridge between the Geneva ecosystem and entrepreneurial communities across developing and emerging markets. The program was co-initiated co in 2016 by Impact of Geneva and UNDP, and since then we've grown to be, to be active in over 32 countries with over 200 international partners engaged and over 470 entrepreneurs supported. Um, we're actually the largest global program in the Impact Hub Network, which is something that we're very, very proud of. Another thing that we're really proud of is that we actively support women-led ventures each year. In 2021, 54% of the ventures that we supported were women-led. Impact Hub Geneva, which is the hub that initiated Accelerate 2030, is just one of over 100 hubs around the world in about 65 countries. Impact Hub Network has been a catalyst for entrepreneurial action for over 15 years. All big ideas start small, and in the case of Impact Hub, it was in 2015 with one community in one city. It was a space for anyone who had an idea for a better world to meet, collaborate, and a place where ideas turned into impact. Today, we're a global network of over 24,000 members worldwide driving change across their communities. We also, um, being supporting women entrepreneurs is part of our DNA at Impact Hub, with over 50% of our members, our community members being women, 57% of entrepreneurs in our programs are women, and over 80% of ventures in Impact Hub across the group have women in leadership. Um, I'm going to, I would like to ask, introduce our two speakers for today, Bara and Emily. Bara is a social entrepreneur, co-founder and CEO of T-Joint with over four years of experience as a GIS specialist, project management expert, concentrating on economic development, empowering rural women and striving to achieve digital transformation and financial inclusion. Bara is also a Sudan laureate and the East African representative for the Women in Africa Initiative. She's also, and we're very proud of this, an Accelerate 2030 Global Finalist from our um, 2021 edition. Our second speaker is also really amazing. Her name is Emily. She's the founder and CEO of Shake to Win, and she's a technology and innovation enthusiast, particularly in the realm of art and culture. She's dedicated to using technology for the greater good. Her interest includes staying current with advancements such as blockchain, cryptocurrency, Web3, and DAOs. By effectively utilizing technology, Emily believes we can enhance consumer experiences and drive positive change in our society. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Emily and Bara. Welcome, Emily. It's nice to have you both here, and we're really excited. Um, before we kick off with the first, oh, please go ahead. Yeah, hi, guys. Hi. <laughs> Um, so before we kick off, I just wanted to say to everyone listening who has joined us today, thank you for joining once again. If you have any questions for us, please either use the chat function or the Q&A 
function and we have some time at the end of the session dedicated to getting answers to your question from our amazing speakers. So welcome once again, Bara and Emily. It's so great to have you here. Um, and we're gonna start with a question that we always ask any entrepreneurs and thought leaders because we think it's really, really important. And that is, what is your personal why? What, are, what inspires you? What inspired you to start your business and what motivates you to keep going? So we'll start with you, Bara, and then we'll go to Emily. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, first of all, it's my pleasure to be here with you today to celebrate this amazing day and happy International Women's Day for both of you, Adesi and Emily, and to all the audience who are listening to us right now and to all the women uh, who had have the positive impact in our lives, our moms, our friends, our uh, colleagues, and all the women around the world. I wish them all the happiness and the success. And as for me, uh, it could be that volunteering work and helping social economic vulnerable people is a big part of my life. And uh, also the fact that Sudan has many raw material for successes as a country, including the, can you hear me very well? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. For okay. example, the youth population in Sudan he is, is 68% of the 43 million people in Sudan are under the age of 30. In addition to that, uh, there is abundant natural resources in our country, starting with the, uh, the largest Nile in the world, the Nile River. We do have fragile agriculture, uh, lands, and a lot of resources. But still, can you imagine that 64.5% of the population of Sudan are still living under the poverty line. And with 8 million minimum wage families and productive individuals who can't access to microfinance, I'm using microfinance as a tool to help them help themselves in addition to increasing the production and seeing them happy and have even the, I can say the, uh, basic life needs like food, health, and even the education is overwhelming and having a sustainable business is what making me continue what I'm doing. Thank there you, uh, Emily. Yeah, so, so my name is Emily. I'm from Hong Kong, currently Shanghai. Uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur and all the things I do is about cultural technologies and art technologies because I'm personally, I'm a writer and I love traveling around. I have been to 60 countries, around 200 cities and across the world, which is I'm really lucky to have this experience in life. The more I travel, the more I discover that the facilitation of the cultural understanding between nations is very important. Because if we can facilitate, for example, China, we have um, one of the biggest population in the world, but not more, not, not many people, not all the people can speak uh, Spanish or can speak English. So when they travel around, maybe sometimes they can only go to the places where what what is the biggest uh, platforms that drive them to go, but they may miss a lot of you know cultural appreciation places that they could visit and also meet the local people and learn about the real culture while they are traveling. So that's why I founded uh, the second uh, venture that I found, which is the SDW Innovation, which is a cultural platform that help over 4,000 businesses across the world to digitalize their story into a China social ecosystem, which is integrated with WeChat, one of the biggest applications that people use. So when travelers from China, they go over the world, they can use their languages to discover this amazing 4,000 places across the world without the language barrier, the cultural barrier that they can really learn about the culture, which is the first step. We believe that if we can learn about the culture better, that there will be less war, uh, there will be less, you know, uh, a lot of, you know, misunderstanding in between when we're doing like a business fight or something like that. So that is uh, the second ventures that I do. The third ventures that I launched last year, which is like an art tech platform, we use blockchain technologies to facilitate the um, creator economy and also to help the global museum and foundations to have a sustainable fund rate funding uh, under different circumstances. Have you ever imagined if one day when, when we wake up, there is no more museum, there's no more historical heritage, you know, this is terrible, you know, 
for me, that's uh, reading about the uh, uh, UNWTO and UNESCO report over the previous three years. Over 35% of the museum and heritage sites is going to close permanently. They have a big hit of financial uh, 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 impacts. So that's why it motivated my team and I uh, founded the Appreciated.io, which is a platform that we help to leverage the blockchain and NFT, uh, digital um, you know, token tokenization technologies that could help the museum can have a uh, new way to digitalize their cultural you know, uh, assets and decentralize the ownerships to more uh, you know, young people, young collectors across the world. Meanwhile, when you're buying something, you're buying something with purpose. And this is partially will contribute back to the real life cultural and heritage preservations. And we're very lucky to get the Van Gogh Sai Foundations from the Netherlands to support us for validating our idea. So what makes us, what make me wake up every day and full of energy is, is about, I believe uh, what makes human great is about the creation, the creativities, and also the innovation that we can drive technologies, how we can create the social goods. So uh, I just finished another uh, speaker uh, speaking uh, forums with over 200 people in uh, Shanghai and talk about this wow. as well. Very happy to be here to uh, meet you all and share more like uh, uh, great ideas and innovation thoughts uh, together and exchange ideas together. Thank you for inviting me to be here. Thank you, Emily. Thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. Um, so Bara, my next question goes to you. Can you tell us about your company T-Joint and how it's working to achieve digital transformation and financial inclusion in Sudan and kind of like how that ties from what you just spoke about with your why and um, poverty in Sudan, despite all the resources? Okay, as I say that 8 million minimum wage families and productive individuals in Sudan can't access to microfinance, and that's due to lack of know-how, the microfinance, geographic distribution, long procedures, and high operation costs. And here, T-Joints come to help. T-Joint is an online platform. We, we uh, delivering complementary services in like uh, training, feasibility studies, electronic payment of installments. In addition to loan tracking system, we give it to the uh, uh, finance providers like banks, microfinance institutions, CSR of the corporate and even NGOs. We leverage the technology from manual and traditional way to uh, by providing an online platform to request finance so we reach more customers in less time. And beside the loan tracking system, we provide an accurate statistics and real-time report. And our team work to leveraging and achieving financial inclusion successfully through facilitating analyzing electronic installments. And we also work towards three of the SDGs, which are no poverty, gender equality, uh, and uh, decent work and economic growth. Thank you, Bara, that's amazing. Um, Emily, could you tell us about your experience creating um, the barrier breaking innovation Shake to Win and what that impact has been so far? Okay, so uh, first, uh, we're very happy to be nominated as a finalist of the UNWTO Rural Tourism Innovation Competitions 2021. Uh, we are the only Chinese company who entered the final seven uh, competition, even though we don't win the award, but we are al already very grateful to share our idea and innovations to a global audience. Um, so, and secondly, uh, during the COVID time, I think a lot of uh, tourism sectors are facing, you know, um, heavy financial crisis and they don't even have, you know, budget to digitalize. So we, uh, we, we offer, you know, our platforms, our SaaS platform, which is very easy to use. Even ice cream shop owners can register on our SaaS platform that for free for over 300 businesses in Mexico, especially in the magic town, which is a small town close to the big cities that they could be registered as a, um, you know, a uh, merchant as a sport for us to translate them into a Chinese languages and tell the story in our social media platform and also our travel app. So that is something that I'm very proud of our team during the uh, COVID time that we are doing this kind of uh, uh, in innovation process and also good offering to help the tourism industry to continue to digitalize. 
And second, talk about the impact. I always believe that a good uh, business or a good product, uh, you don't need to do over marketing. People will try to look for you if you are offering a true value to the user, to the merchant, and to the society. So when we found our platform that we already positioned ourselves, our Chinese name is Shang Yu Di. So it means that it's appreciations during your travel. So while we facilitate the connections between China and overseas, you know, destinations, it seemed impossible before because normally the tourism uh, small, medium-sized uh, spots, they, they will pay a lot of money to the tour operator. And then the tour operator, you know, offer the services to the end user, but then they charge, you know, double. So at the end of the day, the end user go to the places and then they enjoy the services at the discount rate. So this is something that is really uh, not, not, not good as well. So that's why we created this uh, Break the Barrier products that to help the small, medium-sized business can, con con can directly talk to the customers, talk to the uh, independent travelers. And we achieve, um, you know, over 50,000, you know, usage when we launch, uh, after we launch one year and a half, which is we, we, we spend zero marketing effort. Uh, we just, you know, friends, refer friends and recommend places that because every single locations, the 4,000 locations that we acquire on our application is all checked by our team and our teammate. I personally visit 800 of those uh, in the previous COVID time. And to ensure that the store is exceeds, the product is great, the service is good. And that's why the user will come back uh, when they travel in Netherlands, they use our app. When they travel in Belgium, they use our app. We're actually only focusing in Europe and Latin America and also Africa. So it's very interesting that we bring people actually further, not just going to close to China to travel just for leisure, but more on a mission to learn the culture, to facilitate in the future. Maybe it could be an impactful, um, you know, journey that to impact the future career. So that is something that I, I think is very interesting to explore in the future in Africa market. Yeah, well, that sounds really exciting. Um, so Emily, my next question goes to you. Um, yep. Both of you have spoken about the innovations that you've created that are solving specific problems. But I'm sure that you've had some barriers that you faced trying to access these digital innovations or create these technologies. What are some of the innovations you face and how do you think that we can address them, especially for women entrepreneurs? Mm, that's a very good question. So my previous conference also asked this question as well. Um, so I, I think that when you creating, so in China, you know, uh, we are very quite advanced in digital innovation. So for example, we don't bring cash anymore in our wallets. Everywhere you scan a QR code, you use Alipay, WeChat Pay, then you, you pay already. So it's super convenient. But I remember, I think five years ago when I uh, pitched uh, Shake to Win, the, the, the platform in Europe, and when people are still using, you know, credit card and cash, and people don't, don't actually know what I'm talking about, you know. So I said, ah, try to imagine if you stick a sticker in your uh, front door and then people can scan it, can pay to buy your services. Everything is super cashless and super innovate. And people was like, okay. So, so it seems so complicated. So, so how much is it, <laughs> you know? So then um, after, but, but I think being an, an entrepreneur, no matter you are female entrepreneur or male entrepreneur, when you want to create something that is really valuable, you have to validate your idea to your end customer who are going to pay for you. So by walking door by door and, you know, sticking the sticker in front of the door, I personally do 800 spots. And then my teammates also in Spain, in Mexico, that they also, I encourage them to do that and it helped us to shape the product experience into a you know a, a, a seamless and easy to use experience like even an ice cream shop can register their store in five minutes per month with our platform and with seven days it already can be visualized in the Chinese markets that with the store information as well so that is something that I think uh, we should uh, listen to the market needs and also to turn our products into a more adaptable uh, way for uh, local merchants or local uh, business that they could really use it uh, 
with by phrasing that you can uh, coach them from phrase one to go to phase two and phrase three. And don't be afraid of being rejected. Sometimes that when your idea is super advanced, super uh, innovative, and people will just say, okay, that's too complicated. I don't want to use it, you know? And that is a good, uh, uh, good, good feedback as well. So you can simplify the product design, the product uh, usage journey as well. It actually, every rejection is helping us to shape our products into a more sophisticated and more helpful, can be a very good value products for the local, really can help them for the business growth. Yep. Thank you, Emily. Those are really good answers. Um, Barr, do you have anything to add to that in terms of some of the barriers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, for me, I will definitely say it depends on the context, but from where I come, gender discrimination and equality and underrepresentation of the labor market are the biggest three barriers, but it's so difficult to have a social acceptance in such a male dominant ecosystem, even as a tech employee or even as a developer. So uh, you can imagine being a woman entrepreneur and running your own business and having your own uh, saying and actions. So even when it comes to negotiations, you will definitely have someone in the table who would underestimate women capabilities. So I think uh, still we can address these challenges through different ways and we can solve it through, um, for example, supporting access to tech knowledge for all the women and even make effective policies and legalizations for them. And the most important is to promote female role model as for example, um, Emily, I'm learning a lot from you and seeing a role model in this business could make someone seeing uh, a woman in the field who succeed and across a lot of barriers would uh, be very encouraging for a woman to enter the sector. Yeah. I think it's super valid. It's actually not only happened to you, it's also happened to me when I pitch investor. So as a female, you know, tech entrepreneur, and then uh, you're pitching investor, and sometimes that uh, gender really sometimes matter, especially in uh, Asian countries, I think. So, uh, Even for the African countries, yeah. <laughs> So, but but then I think it's it's um it, it's it's very interesting that uh also by you know even though you get rejected from investor and you can understand the the perspective differences and it is a good learning process as well and to uh also to adapt yourself and also to adjust yourself maybe you can change another angle to pitch. So for me, I think the gender uh, equality, uh, I always value this and I promote a lot of uh, gender equality in China, in Hong Kong, involving different you know, voluntary uh, organizations. And I really think that helping women to grow and to set us as an ex example uh, to be success in the, in the industry is the first step. And then after that, that we can hire, when I'm doing hiring, I always, um, you know, um, um, uh, preferring, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, women, and especially, you know, uh, women that maybe they are a mom already, because I am a mom, you know, so I have my my son just turned two years old, and I I feel that you know you need to give enough opportunity for uh, women to sh to show their talents, and as an entrepreneur, we own our company, then we have a say, you know, so by then that I think we can do a lot more in, in the in the coming years with our business growth, yeah. Thank you both. Those are really amazing question um, answers to the question. Um, so Emily, this next one is for you. And then the next question will be for Emily again. Uh, yeah. Sorry, no, I meant Bara. Apologies, Bara, this question is for you. Um, so you've already mentioned that you're with your with T-Joints, you're working specifically with financial services and microfinance for um, underserved communities. How do you think technology can be leveraged to empower marginalized communities, particularly women in emerging markets? Okay, I would say that technology can be leveraged to empower communities uh, through different ways. And one of them is it could be helping these community to have a formal records as one of the biggest problem is the big amount of the cash outside the banking system because there is no sophisticated uh, tech maybe uh, 
platform in this area enough to link all the sort of trading, uh, trading in a way that all the transactions are traceable. So lack of the formal trading documentation could be easily solved through the technology like uh, um, payments app and even the cash wallet and uh, and other solutions. But particularly in this, uh, particularly women in this rural area uh, who have uh, a small businesses or they are uh, small and medium enterprises owners could help them in different ways. And also the supply chain management could be uh, very uh, helpful for them, like having an e-commerce so they can buy their tool, their raw materials, or even sell their products. But the solution could be easily like even a simple way if they have a children who have smartphones, they could raise awareness and teach them how to use it, how to use the social media platform to, to sell. And even after that, when they do have access to, to the internet, they can easily educate themselves and have uh, a tools and skills to add for them. Thank you, Bada, for that. Um, so my next question goes to Emily. What trends and opportunities do you see emerging in the field of digital innovation? And how can women entrepreneurs take advantage of these trends uh, to drive impacts and growth? Um, I think the trend, what I see as an entrepreneur, um, that is about, you know, anything about sustainability will become a very heat topic uh, among the investor, no matter investor or you know, uh, consumer markets and different industry that will be talking about sustainability. But I want to highlight that because uh, sustainability is not just about you know, environmental, it's not just about green and all this kind of stuff. You know? Actually, what we have been doing is about how to make culture and art more sustainable. So try to imagine how many places that, uh, for example, during the war, how many places museum is being destroyed, you know, if we can use the technology to migrate them or preserve them already in the blockchain or in the metaverse so that we can preserve our human wisdom. It's not just about art and heritage, it's about human wisdom. If one day that chat GPT is going to evolve to a, a very advanced version, so what is the value that makes humans as a human? It's our human wisdom. So I think that uh, this is very important that when uh, we, women and entrepreneurs actually have a great advantages to uh, join the arts and cultural industry because uh, it requires a lot of, you know, empathy. It requires a lot of patience to learn about the past so that we can innovate for the future. So I, I think that this is uh, something that uh, also my uh, city, Hong Kong, is has been pushing a lot uh, over the previous years on, uh, you know, uh, teaching people how to join the industry and, <clears throat> you know, how to uh, create, you know, a sustainable business uh, uh, model as well in this industry. So sustainability is one of the big topics. And I think that uh, sustainability in culture and art will be another uh, big categories for the future three to five years for uh, the consumer market to grow and also from the investor market to invest. Thank you, Emily, um, for your answer. So this question now is for both of you. Um, in your opinion, what role do organizations like or programs and like organizations like Accelerate 2030 and Impact Hub play in promoting equality in entrepreneurship and creating a more inclusive ecosystem? Uh, we can start with you, Bara. Okay, uh, as for me, this kind of organizations and programs do allow entrepreneurs to have an opportunity to showcase their work, like uh, starting your business and scale it by your own isn't uh, very easy, but through this community and with the diverse people from different backgrounds, finding uh, support and technical know-how and uh, access to the network and even uh, investments and opportunity and all the programs, components and stuff like that would give a solid base. But for example, for me uh, in back to 2021, when I couldn't came to our scaling week, uh, 
your team was very supportive to me. Mala, Lopka, and all the team was very supportive. And I even have a problem like uh, I couldn't access to the internet most of the time. So they were very supportive and helpful. So it means a lot uh, for me being in this kind of international uh, and diverse people. Thank you, Vara. Um, we really appreciate you as well. Um, Emily, would you like to share your thoughts on this? Yeah, I, I, I think I think your organization is super interesting. So when uh, Emily, another Emily, uh, approached me to, invite to be a speaker, I said, yes, I, I would love to do it because I think it's to facilitate the internet so, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneur or, or people who want to involve in uh, how to create a sustainable business to be involved and participate in this kind of events, to meet interesting speaker and also audience as well, to exchange perspective. And with the more exchange of the different perspective, it can help actually to facilitate the innovations to go to the next stage. So I think um, having an organization or being involved in the organization such as uh, Impact Hub. So I, I was also a speaker of Impact Hub Shanghai as well and TechX events and et cetera. So I, I think the most valuable things is about uh, you guys' capability and uh, ability to amplify the sharing from the speakers and the story mm -hmm. to a uh, bigger, uh, widen target audience that they really care about the sustainability and um, um, this kind of topic. So I'm very glad to be here today to meet you all. Thank you. Um, so our last question goes to both of you again. Um, what advice would you give to an aspiring entrepreneur who is interested in using digital innovation and technology for impact? Uh, we can start with you, Emily, and then go to Barra. Yeah, so uh, so I think uh, my advice is uh, when when you think about you know the social impacts, uh, I, I always I, I'm a thinker actually. So uh, why well, I love to uh, think and also ask people's uh, advice on validating my business idea before I start building anything with a concept with a model uh, around one hundred people. And sometimes the people say that. You don't need to tell 100 people about your idea because they will steal your idea. But, but that's not true, you know. If your idea is strong enough and if you're, you know, um, having, you know, these 100 people around you, either <clears throat> these are customers or, or you can build MVP products to pitch your pilot customers and getting gathering this idea is, is, is feedback is very important. So gathering feedback is the point one. And the second, second thing is about uh, having yourself to be um, adaptable in different cultures. Because even you are selling the same products, you're selling an Apple, or maybe not an Apple, you're selling a technology product in uh, China or in uh, you know America or in uh, India or Africa or Europe is totally different level of understanding. So by then you need to have a flexibility uh, for yourself to adjust your products uh, with a level that you really can help to create a true value to the users of that specific countries. So that is the two advice that I will um, advise for uh, uh, startup uh, founders that consider. Yeah. Okay, as for me, I do see that technology adaptation could be very challenging and even raising awareness for your uh, users could be very challenging. Also, there's um, a challenge related to the regulations and law in a country like Sudan. Also, the market dynamics, like if you are starting uh, a non-existing solution, like uh, in the market that you're working in, it could be very challenging for you. So I would could say that don't rush things and work on your MVP or minimum valuable product, then do your validation and just keep trying and everything gonna be okay. So don't stop it and go to work. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you both for such an insightful conversation. Um, I don't think we have any questions in the chats. If anyone has any questions, this is the time to share them and we'll get to them. Um, but for now, I don't think we have any questions. Um, so, sorry, I'm just checking. Um, I think we have a question for Emily. One second, I think it's still coming in. Um, okay, so is there any challenge for a mom entrepreneur? And what are the challenges? Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think I think um yeah, before COVID, I, I was a very um like I like I love working uh you know for for the passion for the missionary project. So, uh, being a mom is just helping me to evolve myself. So that's why I founded my first uh, venture company. It is kind of amazing that people think that I'm crazy. Like, how can you give birth to a baby, taking care of a young kid, but then you have time to fundraise and found your first company. I think that the, the some, 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 sometimes that is very um, mentally challenged because you have to uh, focus on your kids. And also, you know, you have to focus on our startup because it's in the very early stage. So time management is a very, very important key thing that for a mom entrepreneur to learn. I think I use my time more e efficient and effectively after I, I had my baby. So for example, tonight that uh, I, I come uh, for an event speaking time slot and also to speak in this event. And then I manage I also to discuss with my husband my another half. So you need to have a very uh, considerate another half partners that who understand what you are doing and also the, to take care of my uh, son tonight, for example. And during the time, I think the biggest challenge uh, about the time, how you can make your time use more effectively. And also that uh, I think uh, Focus when you focus on your family and and spend time with son. Uh, so I spend my whole weekend. I I said to my whole old company teammate, don't reach me over the weekend because I won't reply. <laughs> so that is the rules. And I think keeping this, you know, work life balance and focus on family and also to, it's also keeping yourself as a female entrepreneur so more mentally healthy as well. So it actually could, um, it, it actually, that is my tricks or my experience to share with you all. So don't be afraid to be a mom. It's the greatest gift from God. And if you are pregnant, don't be afraid of, you know, it will affect your business. It will not. And you just need to manage your time better. Yeah. Thank you for that amazing advice. And um, we have another question from Karina. Um, and um, the question says, Tubara and Emily, thank you for your openness. Question for both. If you were to do both, if you were to do, sorry, if you were both to do your entrepreneur journeys again, is there any specific thing you would do differently and why? Because mm. that's Tubara. I'm still thinking about like things, but for me, when I started my journey, uh, it wasn't about uh being in a microfinance field, to be honest, I studied GIS. Uh, it's the geographic information system. I was an engineer, but I went to a program called uh, Startup Weekend Khartoum. And uh, the theme of the program was financial inclusion. And that's how uh, I started looking for things uh, at that time, I didn't even know what is the meaning of financial inclusion, if you can imagine that. But after uh, making my research and knowing more about it and start this, uh, I, I came up with, with T-Joint. But the one thing that I would say is to be open to different opportunities like Emily is doing, uh, like different companies she's a serial entrepreneur this is the path maybe i will start doing as uh, now i'm an mba student and i'm open to different opportunities so when my company is very stable definitely i will start uh making a new company in maybe different sectors as there is a lot of sectors that i think have a lot of problem and a lot of chances that I can fit in like education here in Sudan education suffering from a lot of things so infrastructure and even the way of learning and stuff like that so maybe I would go to uh, another sector maybe thank you and you Emily is there anything that you would do differently and why I think I will if I if I will do our startup again, I, I think I will push myself and my team even even harder on learning everything. So uh because I, I feel that uh 
I founded my third uh, venture. That one of the things that helping this venture grow faster uh, than the second venture is uh, we keep uh, learning. I, I, I set a rule to my uh, co-founding team and also the new members when they join that you need to spend two hours per day to learn the industry related information. And then we facilitate the uh, what kind of app you are using to learn. And then we have like this monthly sharing of what we have been learning. It helps each other to grow a lot. So uh, if I will be doing my fourth venture, I'm not sure if I will in a short timing, but if one day then I will set up a really like a learning program in, uh, uh, in, in also a reward. Because when you see your team is learning every day, then you see your business is growing. Yeah, in return. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we only have time for one more question because we have about five minutes left. Um, and this question is from Mala. What are some of the things that you do for yourselves to recharge? To recharge. Who wants to go? Anyone can go. Para, would you like to go first? Okay, I would go. Uh, for me, uh, I do painting since 2017. I do have, um, like you can say, the canvas and the colors and stay uh very calm in my room and just to start doing this kind of things that recharge me and also having a time with my co-founders like uh some people saying that if you are an employee you will work for like eight hours but when you are a co-founder for a company or even a, 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 a startup, you will work for like 16 hours a day. And literally we are working all the time. So having a time with them, just chilling, relaxing, and maybe doing any activity does recharge me a lot. That's great. Mm -hmm. Jealous. Actually, you know, I, I, I set up like a, a, a four o'clock wine or beer time break uh, of the day, 4 p.m. with my team because my team has a very diverse, diversified background. So some of them from Korea, from Spain, from Venezuela, from Mexico. So basically, if we can cheer uh, together in one place, then we will have open a beer, you know, having some chill times together, you know, relax and discussing non-work topic. And if, if not, that we actually from the previous three years that we are we're still keeping this practice. And some of them that we still cheers over the Zoom call. <laughs> it's very important to keep this practice as well. And another thing that how to keep yourself to be um, relaxed is about the meditation habit. So I started to meditate. I start to learn meditations like five years ago when I uh, founded my second venture. Because you know when you have two venture overlap, then uh, it, it's kind of like very intense. So uh, in the morning that um, I have a very good uh, using some apps and also one of my best friends who are very good at meditation and wellness training. So uh, teach me how to meditate. And then I found that if you can spend like 10 minutes, even like five minutes to meditate yourself, to clean up your thoughts and it helps you to boost your overall, the daily productivities as well. So meditation is really helpful. So uh, yeah. I, I think um, these two uh, are the, the way to uh, for me to ease my pressure. Amazing. Thank you both for your time. Thank you so much. We have two minutes left and I just wanted to share some final information with everyone who has joined us today. Um, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Bara. Um, so we're excited to share that Accelerate 2030 is going to be launching its fifth edition this year which is great news and we're really excited about yeah. it. <laughs> uh, so excited. in a few months, we're going to be launching and um, we are going to be, um, we're asking anyone who wants to engage with us, whether you're an entrepreneur, um, a partner, an investor, you want to mentor um, ventures, um, we would like to you to join our community. So please reach out to us uh, to engage with us. This is um, what the fifth edition is going to look like. Um, tentatively. So we're starting with the global out outreach, which is the first phase. We're going to have a call for applications in a few months, followed by the national skill readiness programs in the different hubs across the world. And finally, um, ventures are going to be selected to be a part of Global Scaling Week in Geneva. 
Um, and they also have the opportunity to participate in Building Bridges Week, which is an amazing opportunity to build connections with the Geneva ecosystem. So it's really a, a really great opportunity for everyone watching. We really want to encourage a lot of um, women-led ventures and women entrepreneurs to apply to the program this year. Um, so you can get the support you need to scale your impact and scale your business. So if you would like to um, engage with us, you can visit our websites and fill out an engaging a form to engage with us on our homepage, or you can just scan this QR code here um, and it will take you straight to a form that you can fill um, with different options for what you would, how you would like to engage with the program, whether you are an entrepreneur or a mentor, an investor or a potential partner. Um, so thank you so much to everyone. Um, there should be some links in the chat from one of my colleagues if, in case anything I said was way too fast. Um, but yes, this was really great. Happy International Women's Day to everyone. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Bara. And yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have Bye. a nice day. Have Thank you so day. much. Thank you Bye -bye. so much. Bye. And congratulations again.